Welcome back everybody, Adam Flowers here, Coffee with Colada presents, and today is part two of David Bowman. Now I've been reading your comments. Some of you are like, this guy didn't break into Frank's house. How come this guy didn't tell his story before when Frank was alive? All right, so let me clear the air. He did what he's saying he did. I, I can have it verified. As a matter of fact, Frank's wife, Elaine, can verify that this guy, what he did, broke, broke into the house, stole the drug. I mean, this is a true story. So I want you to enjoy the second part. There are newspaper articles. I'm going to be posting them in the community section so you guys can go read his story if you'd like to do that. I just returned from Chicago. I just got back uh, less than 24 hours ago. It was a fantastic trip. I have tons of content. I shot a video before I left that's going to be going up. It's an interview with Red Wamet. Red Wamet was an FBI informant. Uh, in Chicago, he were, operated an adult bookstore, and uh, the outfit had the muscle on him. So his story is pretty, uh, pretty, pretty interesting. So that's coming up, and uh, again, all the content that we shot in Chicago, you guys are gonna love it. And uh, interviews that we did in Chicago, some of the family members, of Frank, it's it's really it's really good. So stick around, more is coming soon. Uh, for right now, though, enjoy part two of David Bowman. And if you didn't see part one, go click the card. Go watch part one before you see part two, so this thing makes sense. Okay, enjoy. Colada, colada, grab your favorite brew. Ask a question, he'll answer it for you. The mafia, the mafia, the mafia, the mafia. You better hit prescribe if you know what's good for you. Drinking a cup of coffee with Frank Colada. He'll tell you a lot of, he's Frank Colada. Eventually he did. He ended up giving back. We went to, got back to Vegas and we gave him a, a, an ounce. And I, I know because I cut it up and and for Jerry to bring to him, along with a few lubes too. Uh, but I had, we, we had taken all those quaaludes and put them in uh, uh, Bob Minette's safe deposit box uh, before we left on our adventure in the bank. And, uh, and, I, and I was fronting them to people too. I had a guy that I'd fronted them to and then come back into town and he'd have the money. So we did that for a couple of weeks. And then Jerry uh, was going to Houston anyway. Uh, and so given the situation, uh, we, uh, Joe and I decided to go with him. And he had done a score with those guys uh, that was like his going away score, uh, safe job where they got 80 grand. And uh, I talk about that in my book. It's a pretty, pretty interesting story. So is it, is it now? That's uh, that's where they showed up to take their uh, smoke break, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They left Leo there banging away on the safe, and they showed up at your place. To yeah, Leo, him. and I don't know who else was there, but yeah. Uh, yeah, Ernie and Jerry show up and knock. You know, I get a knock on the door. It's like three in the morning. I'm like, well, who the hell is this? I look out the peephole, and it's Jerry and Ernie. And I open the door and. They looked like they'd both been out doing heavy labor, you know, sweating, big old sweat rings around their arm, armpits. And they just came in, and Jerry comes in, and he gets a pan, cooks up a rock, and sits down. We all just sit there and free base, and, and they were kind of talking about, you know, laughing about how Jerry says, you can hear that sledge hit that safe all over the block. You know, it's like, ching! Yeah, echoed all over the neighborhood, and and I guess according to them was uh, they had they, the kids were there, the husband and wife were on vacation, but the kids were at the house, uh, and they like locked them in their bedroom upstairs while they were doing all this shit. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was wild. But yeah, and then they, you know, we smoked a little bit, and uh, and then they took off. They went back to work. So yeah. that's where he got the money. And yeah, and then he, then, then he then he came back. Uh, uh, you know, after the sun come up, it was probably eight o'clock. Uh -huh. Now the knock at the door, and it was Jerry, and he had a uh, big stack, you know, probably about thirteen grand that he counted out on my coffee table, and and so that was kind of his going out of town money. So you guys, all three of you went to Texas? Yep. Is that where you plotted to kill Frank and Tony? 
Well, that was kind of on the uh, road trip adventure after, you know, while all the back and forth was with Nick was going on. Uh, we sat and discussed that and, uh, pretty seriously. And, I mean, Jerry put it out to me that, you know, he would, uh, he could get Elaine to tell him when Tony and Frank were there. And, uh, and then I would go in and shoot him. And, uh, you know, and it was, you know, I always visualized it kind of like the Michael Corleone, Virgil Solozzo, Captain McCluskey thing. Because it would have been very similar to that, you know, except I wouldn't have just sat, wouldn't have came in and had dinner with them. I would have just walked in. And, but I don't, you know, that wasn't me and it, that wasn't, it, killing them was easy. You know, it, it was the aftermath that would have been uh, the problem. <laughs> Wayne Metucky, Larry Newman. Oh, yeah. I mean, coming after you? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you open up a whole Pandora's box with that, and uh, that, that wasn't the right way to do it. So I decided to do it using the, the cops. So instead of killing him, you decided, I'll give them information, and you knew about the furniture that was in Frank's house. Correct? That's right. And how did you know the furniture was there? Through Tommy Amato, because he helped move it in, so there there was the you know person that brought it in, mm -hmm. and he had mentioned it to Joe, to Sony, and I remember Joe telling me it was before. If my memory serves me, it was uh, while we were getting ready to go to Houston, but. It, I can't remember exactly when, but I remember him pulling me aside saying, you know, he had found that out through Tommy. And uh, kind of like, we got that as a, a fucking ace in our pocket, you know, if we need to use it down the road. And, uh, and, and that was pretty much going to be based on what happens after we get to Houston. Because uh, Joey had serious doubts about Jerry in the first place going down there that he you know put us in a trick bag out in Vegas with Frank you know having me rip that shit off and then you know, kind of folded under the pressure and gave the shit back and I mean I, w I went down there because he went down to manage the bunny club in Houston with a guy named Bob Burnham and he was doing some big time you know cocaine smuggling out of Mexico and as it turned out, uh, it was a blessing in disguise that Jerry didn't hook us up with Bob because the, the DEA had already hooked up with Bob, uh, as, as I found out later, so that was fabulous. And in fact, I actually uh, saw the guy, uh, the federal agent, uh, Jerry Ross was his, his street name, but he was a DEA agent. and. Uh, how I saw him was he came to the condo one night, knocked at the door, and there was this curly-headed dude standing at my door. Hell, I thought he was a hitman from Las Vegas, so I didn't open the freaking door, you know? And, I, and honestly, after a while down there, Jerry started distancing himself from me and Joe, you know? Uh, I mean, he's fucking never around. He's always out with Bob. And, you know, so we started feeling like sitting ducks. And I know when I was in the club, which was real dark, you know, I, I, I was just... I could visualize some guys walking through the door and just, you know, blowing us away. <laughs> and maybe if, if we would have stayed, that's what would have happened. But I, my instincts told me to, to get the fuck out of there. And so you went back to Vegas? And, and that's, you, yeah. And that's and when you contacted... That was in October. Was Initially, it was, uh, uh, I just called the secret witness line. Spoke to Nage, Detective Nage Palmer. And uh, uh, and that, that lasted about two weeks. You know, I basically, I called him and I said, this is your lucky day. And, uh, and then when I started dropping Frank Collada and Tony Spilatro, Hole in the Wall again, I told him, we just spent the entire summer with these guys. We did all kinds of shit with them. I got, I, I got enough to, and we did. We had enough to 
uh, first-hand knowledge of, like I said, like the Ernesto deal that we were involved in. There was a, another score that I gave them. Uh, so, but the big thing was the furniture. And so I gave them that and then that, uh, I, the big point, turning point was when I met uh, Gene Smith on, I believe it was Halloween night of 1980. Mm -hmm. And that's when I met him at the Denny's over there by the cop shop in his white Bonneville and uh, cause that's what he drove back then. And uh, I jumped in and, uh, and shook his hand. I said, no, not what you expected, huh? Cause you're 19 years old, right? right? You're a kid. Right. And, and you're saying I got all this information on Kalata. Right. <laughs> and he kind of looked at me and laughed at me now, you're right. Mm -hmm. But it kind of relaxed him too, because you know, he had a contract out on him. And so I'm sure uh, going to that beat that night he was probably just as scared or more scared than I was, wondering if this was going to be a, a setup to get whacked. Frank had a contract out on Ken Clipper. Well, the, uh, on Gene Clipper, Smith. On Gene Smith. I'm yeah. Sorry, not Ken because, Clipper, of, because of the Blue Steam deal. Gotcha. That was when all that was transpiring. Yeah. They, they sent a couple hitmen out here. They picked the gun up in Denver. They got to town. Gene showed me the two hitmen in the, in the black book. Oh, he showed you Sc the pictures Scalise of Scalise and Scarpelli. Scalise and Scarpelli were their names? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep, and uh, that's, uh, and I looked down and I said, well, I'm glad you let me see those. I said, now I'll keep a real mental snapshot of those uh, so I know what they look like too. Right. Oh, this was, this was, uh, and I think that's what gets lost and it has gotten lost is, uh, you know, when I did this, I mean, this was uh, uh, heavy, about as heavy as it got. And uh, when I first met Gene, uh, I remember one night, I, and I was just getting out of the car. I don't know if it was one of the control by, I think it was before that, but one of his guys were pulling up to come up and talk to him. And he told me to get back in the car because he didn't want his guy to see me. And I didn't say anything. And then I said, you know, I said, I got to be honest with you. I said, that kind of makes me nervous that you didn't want your guy to see me, you know, uh, you know what I mean? Sure. Uh, does that mean you don't trust your aren't, guys? Aren't they on the same team? Yeah. I mean, because this, this was my biggest concern, uh, coming forward is, is, uh, uh, you know, I knew about Joe Blasco, uh, and the reason I, you know, agreed to meet Gene and then, you know, I, I knew Gene was good for straight. He wasn't, you know, bought off uh, because of being around those guys after they killed Bluestein. So I had that up here. Uh, so that was a big deal, you know, that I wasn't uh, basically going to the, to the <laughs> enemy. Going to a cop who was going to go back to yeah. Frank and Tony. That one well, night that was, was going to say, yeah, let, right. you know, meet me down here and just, yeah. You, you knew that those two were definitely adversaries. Yeah. Yeah. And Gene Smith was a straight cop. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, that's, he was. So you wore a wire for him? Yeah, several times. Okay. On, on Jerry. Mm -hmm. uh, after I came, like I said, after Frank got busted. Because when I came forward uh, in October and Halloween, uh, they had nothing on these guys. They went, in fact, just a couple months before was when they pulled the uh, FBI surveillance camera out of the roof. And it was a huge embarrassment to the FBI. Uh, Oscar Goodman just made hay with that uh, all over t the nightly news and the newspapers. Mm -hmm. uh, saying that, uh, calling them Gestapo tactics. Yeah. Uh, so, like I said, big embarrassment, uh, and they had nothing, and then all of a sudden I contact them, and a month later, after quite a bit of prodding, uh, they finally went in and hit them. Uh, but again, I had to meet them, because initially I just gave them the information, and I knew that they weren't, that I was gonna have to look one of these cops in the eye before, 
they were going to make a move on that, you know, because that's a big, that was a big deal. You know, if, if I give them bogus information and they go in there with a no-knock search warrant on Frank Collada, you know, especially after what had happened with the uh, surveillance camera, I mean, Gene told me pretty much, you know, that's not good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I, I, I was, had no doubt. So I said, you know, it's there, believe me. And, uh, like I said, they had to fudge the warrant a little bit. Uh, and that was huge. Once they got that furniture, uh, that was the beginning of the end, basically. And I knew that. I mean, I knew Frank was a ex-felon from Illinois. He was a, you know, public enemy number two out there behind Tony. Mm -hmm. uh, well, hell, I watched him when I was with him, you know, being surveilled myself for that summer. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, was there the night the camera got hauled out. And, you know, it was just, uh, you knew. So, bottom line, he was going down and going down hard. And I figured uh, he would he would roll uh, when the rubber met the road. And Gene Smith kind of laughed it off at me at first. And I was like, yeah, right, kid. Because he, he said to me, he says, well, he says, I don't know. He says, these uh, outfit guys are pretty hardcore. You know, I said, well, yeah, that's true. But uh, we'll see, you know. I said, I think uh, he's been living the good life. Uh, he's got a, a lane now, uh, you know, prospect of going back to prison for the rest of your life, especially the older you get, the harder it is. It's one thing to do prison when you're in your 20s. It's another thing to do it when you're in your 40s and 50s. <laughs> so. So you worked with the Metro Police and then you also worked with the feds, correct? Yeah. the. I mean, work with them. I mean, Gene brought me in uh, right after they busted Frank. And then, uh, and I mentioned this in the book, uh, where Gene had to testify at Frank's preliminary. And he called me up the night before and said, hey, kid, he said, uh, I got to testify tomorrow at Frank's preliminary. And if... Uh, if mom had asked me who secret witness 491 is, I got to tell him your name. And he said, if that happens, he said, I'll contact the Pueblo police or, you know, we'll get you out there and we'll take care of you right away. We'll get you out here. So just be ready. <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, that was a, one of them nights where I just sat there and thought, well, shit, my whole life's going to change tomorrow, you know? But he called later in the day and said uh, that uh, Mom didn't ask him my name. He asked him if uh, Secret Witness 491 was Sal Romano. And Gene said, no, it isn't. And he didn't follow up with, well, who is it? Uh, he just went on to another question. <laughs> so well, he said, we dodged that bullet. So, but I mean... I kind of wished it, it, I hadn't have dodged the bullet and it would have just ended right there, you know, because then it went on and on as I described in my book for quite a while after that. And that's when they brought me into the feds was, uh, it was in January or February, right after the Super Bowl of uh, the one with the Raiders and the Eagles. And I came back to town, and that's when Gene brought me into Arnold E. Gursky and, and then Don Campbell. And my friend was with me, Joe Tassoni was with me too. And he, we spent about three days with these guys just uh, giving sworn affidavits, depositions. And uh, Joe met with a couple other agents. They'd bring in certain guys for certain stuff. Yeah, you know, and they were just falling all over us. And because we had enough, like I said, to do them all right then. And that was initially, again, you know, uh, I know this because, you know, of being this intimately involved in it. 
But at that time, this was before Sal Romano, or they had flipped Sal Romano, and me and me and uh, Joe were everything. Uh, so after they debriefed us, they sent us, told us to go down to Albuquerque and try to find jobs down there uh, uh, to give them some time to put to decide how they were going to use us, basically, you know, in, on what cases and, you know, and just sit tight, you know, we'll, we'll call you in a couple of weeks, you know. So we sat down there and, and it was like, we didn't have, we, we, we didn't have a car. We flew, they flew us down there. We got a, whole, a motel room and we sat around. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm not fucking going to do this, you know. Uh, this is bullshit, is what I was telling Joe. Uh, I said, well, all right, we'll wait two weeks, and hopefully, though, everything will be cool. But it just turned into, no, we, you know, call us back in two more weeks. And after that happened, I was like, you know what? I, I called up and left a message with Arnold. I said, look, when you guys figure out what the fuck you're going to do, uh, contact my folks, I gave them my parents' number, because remember, we didn't have cell phones back then, and uh, I said, you leave a message with them, and I'll, I'll get it, it was in a couple of days, and uh, that was that, and we took off, and, and gonna, went up to Canada, and again, I think I mentioned that in the book, so. You did mention that in the mm -hmm. book, which, by the way, the book is fascinating. I mean, I picked it up and started reading it, and I, I put it down halfway through, to have some lunch, and then I picked it back up and I finished it. The rest, you know, I mean, it mm -hmm. was good. It's a fascinating story. Mm -hmm. This whole thing's fascinating. Well, thank you. To me, it's very fascinating. I'm sure the prescribers are going to think so as well. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, uh, basically, the cops used you to get Frank, mm -hmm. but once they got Frank to roll, they didn't need you any longer. Mm -hmm. So they promised you, we'll take care of you, we'll put you, you know, witness mm -hmm. protection, this, that, and then just threw you under the bus after they got Frank. In a nutshell, that's what's happened. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was uh, just like that. Uh, I had flown out, or they had flown me out uh, May the 4th to testify on those controlled drug buys on Jerry and his cousin and Bob Minette and couple other people and because there were five separate deals and each time he had somebody else with him and so uh, that and understand the whole purpose the reason why I was doing those which I stuck my neck out big time getting back into Jerry after I had had a run-in after coming back from Houston, right after I began to work with the police, and I ran into Jerry's dad one night at the, in a, at the Vaughn supermarket, and all hell broke loose, and he attacked me, assaulted me, punched me in the nose, I thought he broke my nose, and I mean, I could have very easily filed assault charges on him, and the only reason I did it is because it would have queered the whole, you know, I just started, deal with Frank so we had bigger fish to fry so as I, I you know told Gene I, I'll take one for the team this time but you know you know what I mean yeah. uh, once again uh, you know don't don't uh, fuck me and uh, so yeah it uh, that was just me taking that risk of meeting him uh, and believe me my uh, friend to Sony told me you're you're crazy I said you are he was totally against it thought that him and Lewis were going to snatch me up and but I went to the meet with a gun and and so I said look if they try anything I'm going to blast them <laughs> and I told Gene that you know those cops all knew I was you know I told them I said look I, everywhere I go I got a gun just so you know uh, but they were cool with that because I think they, you know, knew that I wasn't just a, a loose cannon or, you know, an idiot out there running around with a gun, you know. 
So how well did you know Nick Costanza? Oh, real well. I mean, we, I, I lived with him. I stayed with him at points in time when we were out there, uh, you know, coming back into town just for a couple days or a week or whatever. What did he do? Uh, Frank, he, Frank told me when I asked him about Nick, he said, well, he's a wannabe uh, whatever. Right. What do you know? I'd, I'd describe him about the same way. Uh, you know, I mean, I guess back in the day, uh, he owned Checker Cab and had his own restaurant out there, but he just kind of, you know, uh, was just kind of a nickel and dime hustler, you know. Uh, they called him the beacon because he moved people. I guess that's what Joe told me. He moved people from their money. And, you know, it's just shit like that. And he, he always wanted to be around uh, uh, Tony. When Tony was at the restaurant, you know. I remember one time he'd, uh, uh, Elaine called and said uh, Tony was down there. And I hear, oh, the little guy's there? And boy, Nick put his shirt on and boom, he was down at the restaurant. So he just wanted to be, like I said, kind of a wannabe, mm -hmm. but not ever, n not, nothing relevant or significant. You said the cops used to rough him up a lot. Well, that was Jerry. Jerry? Yeah. Okay. Nick, Nick uh, was, according to Joe and Jerry both, uh, was very abusive father. Uh, he beat Jerry a lot when he was a kid, you know. To make them tough. I mean, these people were from Newark, New Jersey. They were New York or Newark, uh, New Jersey Italian, you know, family, and that's just how it was, about, and especially in that era, you know, and uh, and it did it made Jerry mean. And uh, where Nikki was really mellow, you know, Nikki was kind of, but he, but Nikki's deal was he liked to drink and take quaaludes, and when he did, he he uh, talked and run his mouth and. Uh, I believe that's probably what got him in trouble, <laughs> or what got him killed. <clears throat> he got whacked. He got. Uh, they found him in the trunk of his car. We found out. I found out about it. Uh, we were in Colorado, uh, in a hotel, and we got a call from Joe's mom, and I guess she had called my folks, and they told them that we were at this hotel. We we're in town, and uh, and she called and said. Uh, they found Nicky Jr. in the trunk of a car. And, I, and I'll always remember because I was just it, just kind of beside myself all day. It really did hit me pretty good because we had just uh, uh, spent some time with him. We had went horseback riding with him up at, uh, down at Bonnie Springs. And we'd kind of hung with him for a couple of days and, you know, just partied with him. And, and, uh, and he was trying to... Uh, because he was a dealer at the uh, at the trot, and he was trying to figure out a way to you know get some people to come in and we could you know work a scam. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why they killed him. And I talked to Frank about this. Excuse me, uh, when I met him about, uh, over a year ago, because I never knew. So tell me about that. <laughs> yeah, I just. Uh, I wanted to do my book for a while, and uh, and I got just to the point where I knew Frank was getting old, and uh, at first I was going to go, I was going to approach Don Campbell, was going to be who I was going to go to, but instead uh, I thought, well, hell, I'll just go to Frank because he had his casino tour, and so I booked a tour on his bus. And or this what was his car with him and Lewis, and uh, I got in and uh, he started talking and I just said, yeah, I know all about that. Yeah, <laughs> I said I'm, I'm secret witness 491. Remember me, David Bowman, and he just kind of like, oh, you're that son of a bitch, and and uh, then from from that point on, we had the the greatest. Uh, relaxed conversation zero animosity yeah yeah okay. i mean it was just uh it was none and we just started talking about shit that only him and i could talk about you know because he knew you know and uh 
what I did, and and we'll see what happens when Campbell, what Campbell has to say after my book comes out. But and so we just basically start talking about everything. In fact, he, he got on the phone and he called uh, Elaine right away after he called Danny Griffin, and uh, I mean just like right away. Just, Oh, I guess he's in the car, you know, because me and Elaine, I knew Elaine before he did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, and it was, and I told, and I told him, I said, I mean, you realize that I saved your life by doing what I did to you. And he, he said, yeah, that's right. Because, uh, you know, as crazy as it all unfolded, and believe me, uh, if somebody would have told me that everything was going to turn out like it did, uh, it, you couldn't you couldn't make something up like this, mm -hmm. of him uh, going down and then you know doing the eight year bid on on the possession of stolen property, and uh, and then getting doing casino and then you know having this you know successful life that he made afterward and and so I saw that and. And I just kind of watched everything be written and told, and and I figured one day I'll come along and tell my story, and that's what what I'm doing. Very interesting. It's a very interesting story indeed. Um, after you went on the tour with Frank and you introduced yourself and told him who you were, hmm. he called me that night yeah. and told me, "You're never going to believe who came on the tour. This guy <laughs> David Bowman." I said, "Who was he?" He said he was an informant that got me busted. I said, hmm. I thought that was Sal Romano. <laughs> hmm. He said, no, no, no. He said there was another. And that's, this the whole thing is so intriguing. Since that day when he told me that, I often wondered. And then when Denny, uh, Denny told me about you and then Ori. Mm -hmm. Ori actually is the one who got me the copy to read. Mm -hmm. And I... I, I, I'm telling, I'm telling all the prescribers right now, this book is really good. It's a very, very interesting book. Yes, I believe uh, anybody that's uh, a fan of Casino and the whole and Frank's books. This is a story that you haven't heard yet. Yeah, and yeah. and it's a, it's a very interesting one. Now, later, once Frank rolled. Was it Frank who gave the information to the cops about you with the pellet gun? Yeah. He's the one who said, oh, he told me this story about this guy, and they looked up a report, mm -hmm. and they found the guy who was robbed, and then they prosecuted you? Yeah, it was just out of the blue. I had already gone back. You know. So basically, he got you back. Yeah. <laughs> Frank yeah. got you back. Well, well, yeah, I mean, it didn't, uh, they ended up dropping the charges, and... It was because of the fact that I knew that's where the source of the information was. And I uh, instructed my young public defender at the time to, uh, I told him about what I did out there, which blew his mind, of course. Right. And uh, after that, he, I told him, look, just subpoena Frank Collada and just watch what happens. And that's what happened. I mean, I knew they had bigger fish to fry with Frank, uh, of course, uh, than to risk bringing him back to testify against me or even just being involved in the whole thing. That's why I don't understand why it was, uh, you know, I think it was just, uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I don't, it's uh, why they would do that to me or uh, let uh, Frank do that. I. I uh, you did go to prison, though, however. Yeah. But for something else. Yeah. That wasn't related to that. Right. And you spent a few years in prison. You think that the feds, you actually spent longer in prison because the feds did something, correct, or held well, you up on something, didn't prosecute you the right way? Well, it was, uh, I mean, it happened shortly after, not long after all this Vegas stuff happened. Uh, I all I believe they did. Yeah, Vegas, because Vegas was definitely contacted and involved after the shooting in Colorado Springs, uh, because that's where Vince and I met one another. And uh, plus, you know, once my name got out there, uh, it's in the computer about me out there, uh, my FBI file and all that. So yeah, it, uh, if 
it definitely uh, intensified uh, the way they pursued us <laughs> uh, in the, on that particular case mm -hmm. because uh, it was uh, it wasn't the way they portrayed it in the trial. Okay. Uh, there was many things that uh, I could point out that I did in the book. Uh, the woman, for instance, uh, that I was with, gave six different versions of what happened at different points in time. Uh, as things changed, her stories changed, you know. And it was basically, like I said, a case of self-defense. We came in, confronted the guy, pulled the gun off the headboard, loaded it, pointed it at me. Vince had a, Vince had a gun. He pulls his gun out, and they got into a brief struggle, and the guy was high as hell, and, uh, you know, the autopsy showed that, and uh, he, he got shot, killed, and uh, we panicked and, and left and uh, went on the run, I guess you could say, for about two weeks, but even though all the while I was contacting the police and, and you know, giving them our side of the story, basically, because I initially read her story in the uh, newspaper after the shooting, and it was I'm like, what? You know? I was like, oh, Vince and I just walked in and, you know, executed him. It's like, you know, it's just amazing uh, what people do under pressure situations, you know, how some people just... They just freak out and uh, do things that are have no rhyme or reason. <laughs> Especially the drugs are involved. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's just, yeah. It just escalates everything. Yeah, and the law and, you know, people start cya and, and, you know. So how much time did you do? I did an eight-year sentence, which I did three and a half years uh, back then. Three and a half years and where? Uh, Buena Vista Correctional Facility. Uh, rifle correctional facility started out at a medium went to a minimum mm -hmm. and then uh, I was I, I sent to another place right before I paroled in Canyon so it was a uh, it sucked I understand it's not a place you want to go yeah it's uh, uh, you know the first six months are are the worst because you're going through adjusting to incarceration you know being you know confined and it is I mean it's a uh, it's something you have to mentally adjust to or you'll lose it and uh, and I did you know I started playing sports and uh, of course got into uh, you know different classes schooling whatever and, and uh, used my time well Wow well, David, this has been a hell of a hell of an interview. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I've really enjoyed uh, hearing this. And when is your book coming out? I don't have a definite date yet. It's uh, just about ready to go to publication. Uh, we're still got the final little things to put together, the cover, and, uh, those little things, and uh, and it'll be out soon. Okay. I will. Uh, I have a date I will let you know but it's definitely coming okay and when your book does come out uh, maybe we could do another interview absolutely and let everybody know it's out if uh, that'd be interesting for you or if you're interested in doing that we can do that uh, and you were secret witness number 491 491 yep. so, well thank <laughs> you very much for this interview and uh, really do uh, appreciate it and uh, I think I'm gonna read the book again Okay. All right. All right, man. Thanks for watching this video, everyone. Please be sure to visit frankcolata.com for coffee cups and t-shirts. Also, hit the like button, share this video. Oh, and don't forget to hit that prescribe button to subscribe. I found gold. I hope you enjoyed yourself. God bless.